So I invite you to pray with me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for this evening, for new faces, for all of the people here and those joining us via Zoom and all of those who will watch this later on YouTube. And we just thank you, Lord, for the community that we have together here at St. Timothy's and beyond of the people who are coming together to get to know you more deeply by diving into your word. And so we just pray, God, that the words of sacred scripture would illuminate our lives, our faith, our relationship with you, and they would speak to wherever we're at. If we are just not feeling it tonight, if we are overwhelmed or tired or worried or anxious, or if we're seeking deeper relationship with you or seeking an answer for a particular question or looking for healing or whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that tonight you would help us to be undistracted and focused to be able to hear, receive, and listen to what your voice is speaking. And so we ask just blessing upon this time and on each one of us gathered here in the ways that we most need it. Remove any distractions, anxieties, or worries, and everything, Lord, this time, our lives, all of those things on our minds and hearts, we lay it, them all at your feet, and we just ask that your will be done. Guide us during this time. Bless all those who still might be on their way or who could not make it tonight. And we ask all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. This is the very last section of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And so, as usual, we will read through the passage twice through. If you're just joining us for the first time, that's what we do. We read through the passage twice. The first time, we get a picture for what is being said. Now, this is a narrative. It's a uh, healing story. And so I invite you, try and delete any image you have of this in your mind previously. And I really invite you to listen along, follow along, maybe even close your eyes at one point, and try and paint this picture fresh in your mind. Act as though there's a blank canvas in front of you. You've never heard this before. What do you notice? What details do you see? How is this unfolding in your mind's eye as we hear this together? Um, so as we enter into this, we are continuing this last section of the middle section of Mark, which is when they're on the way. So the first section of Mark is in Galilee. The last section of Mark is when he's in Jerusalem, Jesus and the apostles in Jerusalem. And this middle section that we're in is on the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. And Jesus is beginning to predict this is what's going to happen when we get there. This is what's going to happen when we get there. And again, the disciples, every time he says that, they just don't get it. They don't understand. They start asking about who's going to be the most powerful, who's going to have influence, what's going to happen when we get there. It's like they're not even listening or paying attention. And so Jesus reminds them to uh, act as, as children, to receive just what a father would, uh, a child would of their father or their parent. Just receive and trust and listen, but they're still not getting it. And this is the very last part of this section. And then we have the entry into Jerusalem in chapter 11. So we'll kind of see some, some closing of some themes or some continued themes here in this story. So this is the healing of the blind man Bartimaeus. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. So this time, just listen to what's being said. Get a picture in your mind. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside, begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, he is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, go your way. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed him on the way. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the story of the blind man Bartimaeus being healed. We're going to read through this a second time, and this time through, I invite you to listen a little more deeply 
So listen, try and hang on every single word as you hear it or see it on the page and see if any particular word sparks a thought, a memory, something just kind of out of nowhere in your mind. It just speaks to you in some way. Maybe it relates to what you're going through in your own life, your own prayer. Maybe it relates to a memory or something specific that's been on your mind this week. Whatever it might be, could come out of nowhere and it doesn't have to have anything to do with the passage. This is not to interpret the meaning of the passage. It's to interpret how God is using the passage to speak directly to you. Okay, so listen for that as we read the second time through. We're in Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more. Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, get up. He is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments to reflect back on these words. Think especially about the things that stood out to you and why you think they did. And any questions that you have, for those of you on Zoom, you can do that just in the chat um, with uh, one another or share that with us in the chat um, to share. But I want to invite you this, um, to make this a little more interactive than we have been doing in the past. Just take a moment once you know that. Just share very briefly. You don't have to say why or get into uh, in-depth detail. But with the one or two people next to you, just what stood out to you. And you don't have to get into why, but maybe just the word or the phrase that stood out to you. Uh, so take about you know 30 seconds to a minute to just do that. Reflect on it, maybe share with the person beside you or near you what stood out to you. And then we'll come back together and you can ask any questions and we can share um, more in depth in the group. And those of you on Zoom, feel free to start doing that in the chat. <laughs> All right, any, uh, anyone want to share with a large group any questions that you have about this passage or those on Zoom? 
uh, as well as anything that stood out to you in particular and why you think it stood out to you. What do you think um, it has any relevance for you? Yeah, Claire. Well, I love the fact that when Jesus called him, he threw aside his coat mm -hmm. and cloak and sprang up and came to Jesus. Just I, it's, it's a very visual moment, but it's also demonstrating his faith and his excitement to, mm. to, to meet the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Anthony. Um, yeah, I'd just say the number one thing for me was that he says, um, go your way, your faith has made you well. Mm. That stood out the most. Awesome, thank you. Katie? Um, Emily on Zoom said, verse 48, and many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Jared? Why did they um, share, like, uh, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus? Why did they include Timaeus in there? Um, I think probably because his father was well known. Because um, you would know, like, if you spoke the language, Bar Timaeus means son of Timaeus in Aramaic. Bar means son of. So Bartholomew, the apostle, means son of Tholomew or Tholme. So you would know that just linguistically. So maybe because they're writing in Greek, they're translating it, and the meaning of his name, but it could also be that him and or his father were well known. It's kind of like James and John. They're always called the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee, based on the, the evidence we have, as I talked about last week, was probably very affluent fisherman, had servants and things like that helping him. And so he's probably well known in the area. So when they reference Zebedee, people are like, oh, that's, you know, who's that? So that, that might be why as well. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce. What struck me was the similarity to what he said to James and John in the previous section. Yeah. Uh, what do you wish me to do for you? And then to Bartimaeus, he said, uh, what do you want me to do for you? Almost word for word, the same thing. Yep. To me, that says, I don't care who you are. You're, I'm a, you can approach me. I'm mm. approachable. And you can tell me what's on your mind. Mm. Now, in the first case, James and John, they were a little bit off base. In, uh, in Bartimaeus' case, he just wants mercy. Yeah. He's, he's handicapped and he needs help. But, but in both cases, Jesus was willing to, okay, what do you got in your mind? Tell me about it. Yeah. It was a similar type of response to people talking to him. Yeah. That gives us hope that maybe he'll listen to us. Definitely. Yeah. Anyone else catch that similarity? It's the same exact question. And there's a reason for that, too. We'll talk about that. Yeah, Katie. Two people. Nick. What's that to him said, he said, take courage, get up, he is calling you. Mm. And then Tom said, what stood out is that a blind beggar had enough faith to call out to Jesus for his help. And then Jesus answered him and allowed him to see. Jesus is always there for us. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Um, yes, it was um, saying that the uh, phrase, take courage, get up, he is calling you. It's also one of my favorite verses um, in this gospel. And then the other one, um, oh my gosh, I lost it. Which oh, one was it? it? Um, a blind beggar had enough faith to call out to Jesus for his help. Yeah. And then Jesus answered him and allowed him to see. Basically, Jesus is always there for us. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, Greg. I struck up uh, at the very end. <clears throat> The very end of the blind man, he did say thank you, but at least you followed him. Mm -hmm. You don't know for how long, 10 minutes or a day, mm -hmm. but at least you followed him. It reminds you of uh, the, was it the 12 lepers or whatever that Jesus healed? Mm -hmm. Only the Samaritan was the one that came back to say thank you, you know? Yeah. This, this guy, it shows that he made at least an effort to do something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What does your faith have, has saved you? What does that mean? So it could have several meanings. The word there for save is sezokin um, in Greek, and it means um, healed. It can mean actually saved, and it can mean like made whole again. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more depth of what, um, what I think he means specifically by that, but that's kind of literally what that can mean. 
in the original Greek. Yeah, thanks. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, Faith. So, so this guy, Bartimaeus, right? He's saying Jesus, son of David. Like, actually, it would be son of Joseph, right? So, mm -hmm. like, he had to know, like, a historical reference that, that he was actually, right? Like, yeah. of that lineage. Yeah, that, that's a messianic title. So Bartimaeus here is calling Jesus the Messiah when he says son of David. You know where else in the Gospel of Mark it says son of David? Nowhere. Only here. This is the only place where someone confesses that to Jesus. And the only place it's happened previous so far is when Peter is prompted to say, you are the Messiah, the son of living God. But he doesn't use that phrase son of David. And that phrase only occurs here in the section a couple times. It only occurs... Twice in Luke and 11 times, it's more common in Matthew, 11 times in Matthew. And I don't know if at all in John, because um, John uses other titles for Jesus. But that's pretty extraordinary. That someone who couldn't even see is the one who can actually see. Any other thoughts, questions? Bruce? Jesus just notes to him... That it, though it was his power that healed him, he says it's your faith that heals you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's a key to any time we're praying for somebody or praying for ourselves. It's an issue of faith. You really believe he can fix you, heal mm -hmm. you, help you, whatever the situation is. And uh, that sort of is the the door you unlock to talk to God. Mm -hmm. is, is faith. And so he said, "You're you had it." Your faith did it for you? Yeah. Absolutely. That's nice. My wife and I were on a walk earlier. She's a professor, those of you who know my wife, and we were commenting about um, how we have absolutely no uncomfortability waiting in long periods of silence for people to talk. So um, not that I'm pressuring anyone, but anyways, but we'll get into it. So if you have other things you want to ask or share or you want to type in the chat, please feel free. Raise your hand here, or Katie, just you know, give me a little wave if someone has anything else they want to add or share as we go. But uh, so what's significant about this passage, first of all, is where it's positioned. The very beginning of this middle section of Mark where Jesus begins to reveal that like this is what's going to happen in Jerusalem and they begin going on the way. It starts all the way back in chapter 8. And the very first thing that happens before they leave on the way is in chapter 8 verse 22. And I don't know if anyone is over there, but if you can see the heading, it says, the blind man of Bethsaida. So this whole section is sandwiched by a healing of a blind man and a healing of a blind man. And how ironic that is, and I think appropriate that Mark, as the kind of editor of this gospel, puts all of these stories of Jesus revealing, trying to get the disciples to see what they're going to do, and they keep not understanding, and sandwiches it between these two people who literally cannot see, and yet encounter Jesus in a powerful way. They respond in faith, and he heals them. So this whole section is kind of about this blindness that we can struggle with when it comes to following Jesus. And even if you're as close to Jesus as Peter was, or if you are as seemingly as far away from God as someone who was an outcast, like a blind person who was relying all on the providence of others, and his blindness was often uh, blamed um, by his own sin. That's what they believed. If you had it, like a physical de deformity or any disability, they believed it was because you did something wrong and God was punishing you. How distant that person probably seemed from God. And so all across the spectrum, we have this Jesus welcoming, and yet it's the people who seem furthest away from him who get it. And then the disciples who, even though Peter confesses, 
he then gets rebuked. And even though Jesus reveals, this is what's going to happen to me, they say, okay, who will be seated at your right and your left? You know, they're, they're uh, combating for power. They're rebuking the children. And Jesus is using the children as an example. And he says, you know, see how these children, you know, receive their parents or rely on their parents. You must enter the kingdom of God like a child. You must rely on God that way. You must trust and listen and be led where you may not know where you are going. And the disciples are like, yeah, cool. So when we get to Jerusalem, it's going to be like super epic, right? And we're going to be like bringing down fire and brimstone. And we're going to be powerful. And I'll be at your right and I'll be at your left. You're like, come on. And then it sandwiches finally at this last portion with another healing of the blind man. So that helps you see the overall structure here is that Jesus is doing all this stuff in Galilee at the beginning of his gospel kind of has this messianic secret. He's like, hey, don't tell people who I am yet, but he's healing people. And then when, he, as soon as he begins to reveal that, our own misconceptions, the disciples' own misconceptions of who the Messiah was supposed to be, get in the way of them seeing what God is going to do. Has that ever happened to you? Has that ever happened where you have a preconceived notion of who God is or what the church is supposed to be like? And maybe it gets in the way of you seeing that God is actually trying to love you in that moment. Or God actually wants you right exactly where you are. Or God actually might be using this bad thing that's going on in your life to bring about an even greater good later. And of course, he didn't want that bad thing to happen. But because he uses all things for good, he's going to use it to try and bless you. I think sometimes our preconceived notions, right, our misconceptions, our idea of who God is, what church is, can sometimes get in the way. And we see that played out in these three chapters of Mark, all coming to this climax or it's kind of like, Mark is kind of like, look, you guys didn't see. Like he's kind of, it's a little tongue in cheek the way he's organized this. And finally showing the audacious faith of this blind man who cannot see anything is the one who has the faith to be able to accept that Jesus is the Messiah using that messianic language and decides to follow him. So this happens as we see in the first, oh, I'm on the wrong page. Um, in the first section of this, the first line in verse 46, they came to Jericho. Do you know the story of Jericho from the book of Joshua? So um, if you've seen Prince of Egypt or you know anything about like the most famous story in the Bible where Moses leads the people out of Egypt, they wander in the desert for 40 years and they come to the promised land and Moses, because of a moment in the desert where he distrusted God, is not allowed to enter the promised land. So he lets his um, predecessor take over and his name is Joshua. And Joshua actually parts the Jordan River in the same way that Moses parts the Red Sea. Uh, but they come across the Jordan River to the city of Jericho. And Jericho is this huge, like, battlement of a city. It has these huge walls. It's impenetrable. It's, uh, like, just a massive city. I think I read somewhere that it is, I think I wrote it down. It's the world's oldest continuously occupied city. One of the world's oldest continuously occupied cities. It's about 15 miles downhill from Jerusalem. Um, hill, Jerusalem's up on a hill about 2,200 feet in elevation. And so Jerusalem has this high ground, and it had great walls that were eventually built around it. Uh, but Jericho had these massive walls for defense. And so when Joshua and this tiny band of these Jewish people who've been wandering in the desert for 40 years um, with not probably a lot of military experience— roll up, Jericho's like, yeah, whatever. Like these people mean us no consequence. And so they pray and God says, march around the city for seven days. And on the seventh day, march around it seven times and then blow the trumpets and the walls will come down. And they do that. And on the seventh day, they march seven times, they blow the trumpets and the walls of Jericho crumble and they take the entire city. And so this place where walls come down, where unexpected things have been known to happen, where God has already worked miracles in the past, is the setting for this scenario, okay? And just like a wall being brought down, you are now able to see the city for what it is. Also, the blindness is being brought down, brought away from Bartimaeus, so he can actually see physically with his own eyes. And so there's a lot of similarities here. So if you want to read that story, it's in Joshua chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Um, so that's where they are. And he was leaving Jericho, so we don't know what Jesus did there. Uh, but remember, he was on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee in that region of Perea, being tempted by the Pharisees. So he crosses back over, hits Jericho, and this is the last stop before he makes those last 15 miles up to Jerusalem. And we see that in the next chapter. And he's leaving with his disciples and a sizable crowd. 
Now, a sizable crowd could be because people are following Jesus, but it's also because people are coming from miles around because the next week is the Passover. And that's one of the three annual pilgrimage feasts where Jews from all over the world, or I guess the local world, because Judaism wasn't that widespread, um, but come to Jerusalem to make sacrifices at the temple. And so the population of Jerusalem swelled um, by like several hundred, like, I can't remember what the normal population is. I think it's around 50,000 maybe. And then it swells to like 200,000 plus during these feasts. So quadruples at least in size. And all these sacrifices happening. So all these people are coming through Jericho. And also Jericho is a place where a lot of the priests and Levites who serve at the temple live. Because the way that the land was divided originally, they lived in kind of all of these Levitical cities, priestly cities all around Jerusalem. Okay, so that's kind of this crowd that might be there. Other priests, Levites in the Jewish faith, other people there for the festival, people following Jesus and his disciples. And then it says, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus. Now it's interesting that he is named. Okay, remember the first blind man story I referenced? It just says the blind man at Bethesda, or Bethsaida. Uh, Bartimaeus is named. The only other person who's named in the Gospel of Mark, who a miracle happens to, is Jairus. And it's actually Jairus' daughter that's raised from the dead, um, or resuscitated, rather. Bartimaeus is named, so that's significant. So it probably means he was a notable person in the early church, probably to Greg's question or point that he probably continued following for a while and was a notable person in the church, a notable disciple. Um, and maybe his father was notable because it has the translation of his name or at least the, the name of his father. However, what's interesting here is that Timaeus actually has another meaning. So Timaeus, the word Timaeus means honor. So his name literally means the son of honor. And the sense of kind of honoring the tradition of the past, honoring who Jesus desired to be, not setting forth our own assumptions or his own assumptions about who the Messiah was. He's kind of this son of that persona. He's willing to approach Jesus as Jesus desires to be approached. And it says he was sat by the roadside begging. Now, in the original Greek, this says sat on the way. Okay, we know that phrase, tehodon. That means Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. So he was on the side of the way. He wasn't yet on the way, but he was sitting there and he was begging. Now, if you were blind, this was really your only means of income. You'd sit on the side of the road begging. You would rely on the good providence of other people because you had no way of earning money for yourself. Um, and charity was a thing that you extended then. Um, so they would lay out their, clo their cloak in front of them and people would throw coins onto the cloak. And this is what blind people did in particular. And then at the end of their time begging, they could just grab up their cloak by all the corners and then they would have all their money. That's how they knew how much they, they had um, and they could keep track of it. So that's kind of what's happening here. So imagine, just imagine the scene. I mean, there are thousands of pilgrims, this giant walled, you know, previously fortified city. I don't know if they rebuilt the walls, but it was still a massive city. All this noise, all of this commotion around Jesus and excitement on the way up to Jerusalem. And this man is just sitting there hearing all of this. I mean, that's his main sense of being able to know what's going on. It would just probably sound like pure chaos. But at some point, somehow, verse 47, on hearing by some miracle that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. He began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. So we already talked about the significance of that statement, son of David. That means this blind man, even though he cannot see, he's only operating on what he has heard about this person named Jesus of Nazareth, is calling him by this messianic title. This title that was used in the Old Testament to say, one is coming who is going to save us, who is going to free us from all oppression, free us from all sin, liberate the prisoner, free the captives. And that one is someone in the line of David, called someone who is a son of David, and that's King David from the Old Testament. And so he, even though he wasn't able to see, was never able to lay eyes on Jesus or see anything that he did on his own, witness it himself, simply by trusting in what he had heard, shouts out this, what otherwise would have been a blasphemous title. Like if he'd been wrong or if the wrong person had heard this, he easily could have been arrested and maybe even killed for saying this out loud, let alone shouting it. So he shouts that and he says, have pity on me. The phrase here for have pity on me is eleison me, 
Does that sound familiar? Eleison. It's one of the parts of Mass. Kyrie eleison. It's the Greek for Lord have mercy. Sometimes we sing that. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. It's the only part of the Mass that is in Greek. Fun fact, you can share it at the next party you're at, you'll sound super smart. So, only part of the Mass that is in Greek. Uh, it's Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. That's where it comes from. Have pity on me, have mercy on me. Same thing. Uh, verse 48, and many rebuked him. Remember this happening back in uh, verses 13 through 16? The first time people come to uh, ask Jesus to bless children. Um, it says, and people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. Still don't get it. Still don't get it. People are coming to Jesus, and his disciples are still rebuking them. Why? Is it because the disciples don't want people to come to Jesus? They don't want people to know he's the Messiah? No, they do. But they're rebuking these people who are of low status. Children have virtually no status in society. They're completely dependent. And then a blind man is basically the equivalent, maybe even less than, because a child can still see, can still maybe do things around the house. A blind man cannot do that. And so these disciples cannot get it in their head that Jesus is not coming to be this popular political overthrower and only be here for the, you know, the mainstream people or the rich or the politically influential or whoever it might be. No, he's coming for the lowest of the low, the marginalized, the oppressed and everyone else. But because those are the people who are always rejected and always feel cast out by religious society at this time and arguably still today. He's the one who, he, they are the ones that he specifically comes to. But the disciples don't get it, so they rebuke. They tell him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more. The bravery here. The bravery here. I wonder if this is, like, have you ever been in a situation where you're trying to pray or trying to witness your faith or talk about your faith? Or you're in a situation just where, you know, that's happening, and then you're just feeling completely discouraged by someone else. Like, why are you even doing that? Why does it even matter? Like, why pray? God's not going to do anything. You know, why, why bring that up? You know, God, you know, God doesn't care about our suffering, or maybe God caused our suffering. Like, people saying those things, or maybe us even having doubts like that, believing those things. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that. But it's hard to just kind of be bold and brave in that situation. Just keep crying out to God, saying, no, like, I'm going to stand for my faith here and now. Like, you don't have to believe this. Or, yeah, I'm really discouraged, but I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep crying out to God. You know, he's still God. Doesn't mean I can understand him or I know what he's doing. But I hope that this is just somewhere in the middle of the story, and I know there's an end, and I know that it's good. So he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Verse 49, Jesus stopped I just, I don't know, I just like that. It's a whole crowd, all this chaos, and then Jesus just stops. And you could, I just, when I read that, I just, yeah, I just hear this, I see this like ripple of silence. Just everyone like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And he stops and just, and he says, call him. Call him. That phrase, I think about that phrase a lot. Because he's saying this to the disciples. And we are an extension of those original disciples. We're called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, which means basically apprentices. We're meant to follow in his footsteps, to be with him, to become like him, to do what he did. That's our job. Every Christian's job is to be a disciple of Jesus. And so that phrase, I hear it spoken to me, call him. Is that how I see myself? Do I, am I calling people into an encounter and relationship with Jesus Christ? Or am I just kind of comfortable in my faith? It's like, this is my faith. This is true for me. If you're here on Sunday, then you know where I'm getting at with this when I was talking about truth. But, um, or yesterday, I felt like, oh my gosh, it feels like a week ago. But anyways, um, you know, kind of getting comfortable in that sense of like, okay, this faith can be mine and that's great, but no one's going to tell, I, I can't shove this down their throat. No one's going to tell me what to believe. And, and we're all just going to be fine doing our own thing. But no, Jesus says, like, at the end of Matthew, go and teach what I've commanded you. Go baptize. Like, you have to go find people and get them to believe this. And no, not in a, 
angry way, not in a condemning way or a critical way or shoving it down their throat. But there's a difference between inviting someone over for dinner and saying, well, I don't want to shove food down their throat, so we're not going to even have dinner, or just saying, come on over for dinner and having a nice meal. It's the same thing with a conversation, right? You don't have to shove the words down, your, down their throat, but it doesn't mean you're not supposed to have the conversation. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Who do we call? Is there someone in your life or in your family who that, that phrase is for? Jesus is looking at you tonight and saying, call them. Call them. Maybe literally, like, I need to call my mom. But, like, I mean, actually call them to relationship with Jesus. Call them to know him. And maybe that's just a simple invitation. Hey, come to a Bible study. Come to Catholicism 101 on a Sunday morning. Come to our book study group for women on Thursday mornings or our men's group on Saturday mornings. You know, come and see. You looking for a community? Come with me to Mass. Come with me to Mass and just, you know, I'll explain to you the, I don't know, 75% of it I understand, you know, or whatever, you know, come with me. I'll teach you the words. Look at the screen. That helps now. All the things are up on the screen. But still, like, how do we respond to that invitation? Those words should haunt us in a good and challenging way. Call him. So they call the blind man, saying to him, take courage. Get up. He is calling you. This is like, I'm patenting this idea. It should be like a printed alarm clock for all Christians. When you wake up, this should be the first thing you say. Take courage. Get up. He is calling you. I love that verse because it just encapsulates everything we need to be reminded of in moments when we're not living our best, right? Take courage. I mean, don't be afraid. That's the most repeated phrase in the entire Bible. Be not afraid. Do not fear. Take courage. All derivations of that. Reminding us that nothing can stand in the way of what God can do in our life if we open our heart to him. Get up. Don't just sit where we are, stuck where we are, complaining or whining or moping about where we are, but get up and be reminded he is calling you. He's calling you. My whole conversion experience as a young man started when my best friend died uh, right before I graduated from high school. And two weeks later, I was yelling at God in prayer. Not really prayer, but I was, I mean, it is a prayer. I know that now, but I was just yelling at God. I was like, if you exist, you're going to hear this. And asking him why he didn't take me instead of my friend. And he said, he spoke to me for the first time in my whole life. And he said, because I'm not done with you yet. In other words, I'm still calling you to something. And because you're still here alive, breathing, that means God's not finished with you yet. That means there is a particular plan and purpose for your life, a unique calling that only you can fulfill that is not completed yet. That should excite us. I should be like, what is it? Like, what do I still have left to do? Not that we're like, you know, rushing to the end. Like, I can't wait to die, you know? But like, uh, you know, but es essentially, if we understand the joy of heaven, part of that is there. It's like, all right, Lord, like whenever you're willing to take me, I can't wait to see it, you know? But waking up each day and saying, all right, Lord, what are you calling me to do today? Not what, what do I want to do today? How do I want to hustle? How do I want to make more money? How do I want to work out so it look better or whatever it is? No, Lord, what are you calling me to do today? I love that phrase, that, that verse right there. Take courage, get up, he is calling you. And that phrase, get up, is the same word, it's in Greek, ejire, that is used for rise up or resurrection. Whenever uh, Paul, a lot of times when Paul talks about Jesus being risen or rising up, he uses either the word um, anastazo, which is a word kind of more for resurrection, or this word, ejire, which means to get up. Verse 50, he threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Visualize this. Okay, first of all, his cloak was spread out in front of him. All the money he has made begging that day is in that cloak. Think about this opposed to the rich young man. Remember the story we read a few weeks ago? Rich young man who was not willing to follow Jesus because he had too many possessions. This blind man who has just maybe a few coins in his cloak and maybe just that cloak to his name chucks it all and gets up. And like, I don't know if you've ever been in an unfamiliar space and then like closed your eyes or something like that, or the, the power goes out suddenly 
you know, and you're not, like, maybe if it happens in your house, you can navigate. But if you're in a new place and all of a sudden, this happens to me all the time in bathrooms, right? Does this happen to you? When you like close the door too fast, you're like, I did not check where the light switch was. And then you're just doing like this move for like way too long. You can just like reopen the door, right? Um, that happens to me all the time. That's like my pet peeve with bathrooms. But especially in other people's homes, switches are always in the weirdest places. But that's what we do, right? When we're in an unfamiliar territory. Now imagine being a blind man who could not even see with this whole crowd of people around him, massive amounts of people, chucks this cloak away, all of his possessions, and just springs up and runs. Not caring who he runs into, if he falls flat on his face. Like this is not only like, a, all right, Lord, I'm not attached to any of this stuff that I have, but it's also, I'm not attached to my pride. Like if I just totally eat it right now, face in the dirt, like it doesn't matter. Like I'm running after you. So completely detached from earthly things and completely detached from those inner things that keep us too proud or too unwilling to maybe be vulnerable in our pursuit of the Lord. Verse 51, Jesus said to him in reply, what do you want me to do for you? This is Mark kind of mirroring what happened in verse 36 with James and John when they come to him and say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you, the gospel from yesterday. And he replied, what do you wish me to do for you? And they ask for this ridiculous thing. And then Jesus tells them like, you don't know what you're asking. Like you, you guys don't know what you're in for. But he asks the same exact question. I imagine this happening like literally right after. And then like the blind man comes up to him and I imagine like James and John over here and the blind man's right here and Jesus is like, what do you want me to do for you? Like, just kind of eyes them a little bit. Like, hey, pay attention. You remember this happened like yesterday? Pay attention to the right way to answer the question. <laughs> like, I just imagine, you know, me and Sassy Jesus, how I love Sassy Jesus. So anyways, that's how I imagine it. Um, what do you want me to do for you? Same question. The blind man replied to him, master. That's what the translation of the word rabbi, rabuni means, is master or great one. They can translate it both ways. I want to see. Now recognize he doesn't say, I want to be cured. I want my blindness to be gone. There's multiple meanings to that phrase, I want to see. I want to see. As all of us who can physically see, we probably had many moments in our life when that was our same prayer, right? We're thinking about the future. We don't know how to handle this problem in front of us, this conflict in our family, how we're gonna come out of this debt, how we're going to, you know, figure out what to do for a career, how we're going to, you know, survive, whatever it is. She's like, God, I just want to see, like, what is it? What have you got for me? Like, what's going on? I don't know. I'm lost. And I, li I like this distinction because I think a lot of times we come to Jesus to be cured and not to be healed. We want the fix, you know. We just want to be able to take the Band-Aid off and for that alley to be gone. When it comes to the whole body, the whole life, mind, body, and soul, that's what it means to be healed, is all of that completely devoted and oriented to God. Not just this little alley, not just this little wound, but our whole selves. That's why there's some kind of, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a healing mass, or you've ever been in a situation where someone is healing, praying for healing over someone. And there's almost this expectation that like if someone has that particular charism, they're going to pray over this person and immediately like you're going to hear bones go back, you know, and that does happen. I want, I want you to know that does happen. I've been in the room when it happens. I mean, miraculous things happen, but they tend to always happen when there's been some kind of acknowledgement beforehand that this physical hurt is also attached to other things that are going on in their life. It's usually preceded by like a, a dynamic talk about like recognizing the different wounds that you have in your life, the different attachments that you have, how that may be manifest in a physical way. And then this healing happens. And when it's a whole body invitation for healing, then that physical curing can sometimes happen. But oftentimes I've prayed over many people who've asked me for healing or to pray. I can't heal people, but to pray for God to heal them through that prayer. And that's always my goal is that I want God to heal you. He probably will not cure you because if, if God does that through me, then I'm going to be like, oh, superpower. Like that's going to go too much to my head, the kind of person that I am. You know, so like I always pray, like I just want this person to be healed, whatever that means, Lord, whatever the deepest wound is in their heart, not this physical ailment that's obvious. If you want to do that, that's great. But I pray that they'll be healed. Is that how our prayer looks? 
Because I think my prayer, and I think most people's prayer is, Lord, I just want you to fix this one thing or give me this one thing. The more I want to be cured, I want this to be cured. It's not I want my whole life to be oriented to you, to all make sense, to be complete and fulfilled in you. And that, to me, is what this statement I want to see says. I want to see and I want to see. Whole body. Jesus told him, listen to this, go your way. Go your way. He gives them the opportunity. He gives him the opportunity. I'm going to heal you. You don't have to come follow me. Go your way. Remember, they're on the way. And that phrase has been repeated over and over and over again in this, in this section of Mark. But he says, go your way. Your faith has saved you. And as I said, this phrase, that word, uh, as Judy asked, Sezokin, it comes from the word sozo, which means healed, made whole, or saved. Now, there's this... this getting into God, talking about salvation here. Like, how are we saved? And we as Catholics believe that we are saved only by the grace of God, only by the fact that he died for our sins on the cross. And it's by our faith in him and that recognition of that gift, the acceptance of that gift, that we are saved through baptism. But we will also be judged according to our works, because if that is something that we believe and we say that we profess to believe, then we have to act that out with our life. Now, what Protestants or non-Catholics believe is just sola fide, that they believe in faith alone. And that actually is not that different from what Catholics believe if you actually put the two things side by side. There's a lot of mistaken beliefs about what both of those mean. But they believe essentially the same thing, that we cannot achieve salvation for ourselves. We believe that too. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot merit it. We cannot lose that gift, that potential gift. So if you imagine like the idea of how do we get saved? on like this uh, graph with four quadrants or in like two different categories. So that gift of salvation, is it is it universal or is it particular? Meaning is it for every people in all times or is it just for a specific group of people? And then over here is, is that gift of salvation, is it unconditional or is it conditional? And we have to kind of decide where does that, where do we fit in there? Where does Catholicism fit? And I think we would agree that the gift of salvation is universal, right? Jesus came to die for all sins. We see that all throughout scripture. Yes, the Jewish people were the chosen people, but out of that came this relationship with God to the whole world. And we see that with all nations. And then the uh, ministry to the Gentiles with the whole world. And when Jesus says, um, you know, go out, go out to all nations at the end of Matthew. So it's clear that it's universal. But I think what a lot of people get wrong is the unconditional or the conditional. That, yeah, unconditional. God wants to save you. And I would say, no, it's not unconditional. It isn't. Because God won't force you. He won't force you. So the condition is, do you respond? It's unconditionally given, but it's conditionally planted and rooted in our own life based on our response to it. That is what I think he means here by your faith has saved you. Because the blind man has demonstrated that he is responding in a radical way to want to follow Jesus. Regardless of what it costs him, he's thrown away all his earthly possessions. He's tossed aside his pride. He's responded to the call of Jesus, no matter the opposition, no matter the rebuking of the disciples, people who stand in the position of Jesus. We maybe have even experienced this too, right? Maybe we, feel, we have felt rebuked by people who are representatives of the church, by other Christians. And even in the face of all that, do we stand up? Do we keep fighting? Do we keep running after Jesus? Because it's about our response. And that's why there's some places in the gospel where Jesus cannot heal. Not that he doesn't have the power to, but he chooses not to subvert people's free will. Remember it happened in his hometown. He went back to Nazareth, and people were like, we know Jesus. He's the carpenter's son. He's nothing special. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, and it says he was not able to work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of what? Faith. That's what it takes. Do we believe? And not faith that's just about belief. Yes, Lord, I know the rules and the regulations. I've got the Catholic manual right here. I do all of these things. I check my boxes every week. I wear a suit to mass. I've got my tithe envelope right here. I'm good to go. No. No. Is it in here? Is it in my whole life, my whole heart, everything I do? Am I willing to put that all at the feet of the Lord? 
That's why he says your faith has saved you. And then a word we haven't seen in a little bit, but remember this is one of Mark's favorite words, immediately. Because remember, this is eyewitness accounts. So Mark is just boom, 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 going from story to story to story. So he always has this word immediately. But I love being reminded that the action of God when we have faith is immediate. You know, I think a lot of times when I'm praying and praying and praying and praying for something and it's not happening, a lot of times I can tend to blame God. They're like, God, what are you doing? What are you taking your time for? I think I need to look in the mirror and say, why don't I have the type of faith that's eliciting an immediate response from God? What am I holding on to still? What am I holding on to still? What am I asking for that's too pigeonholed or too selfish or too narrow in my view of how God is desiring to work in my life? Am I willing to throw aside the cloak and all the coins in it? Or am I just asking him like, God, there's, there's just this coin, just this, I need this, that's it. Keep everything else where it is. I like this part of my life. But maybe that's not his will for us. Maybe he wants something better. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. That phrase, teho do. So we see by that phrase that Bartimaeus not only is healed, not only responds in faith, but now he joins Jesus as a disciple. He becomes one of his followers. That's why I think he's named, because I think he continued to follow, and he continued to be known to other people in the early church as that blind man that unabashedly chased after Jesus in Jericho, was miraculously healed, and followed him all the rest of the days of his life. Because he got it. He understood for what the, the last three chapters the disciples couldn't get, despite being with Jesus day in and day out. They couldn't set aside their preconceived notions. And I don't know if they even knew that when they got into Jerusalem. Because what happens, we'll see in the coming weeks in the chapters in, in, uh, in Mark, what happens? They abandon him. They all leave. Their preconceived notions make them run. But Jesus still dies on the cross for them. And he still welcomes them back and reconciles them. But it's if they come back. He doesn't force them. And luckily, most of them, 11 of them, except for Judas, as we were talking about earlier, not that I'm calling Bay Judas. <laughs> I recognize that not everyone else was privy to that conversation, so that looked like I was like, hey, Judas. No. Um, except for Judas, I'll come back. Praise God. And Jesus offers us that same opportunity. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, no matter where you're at right now in your life, imagine tonight Jesus calling you to see with new eyes, your life and where he's calling you, to speak that phrase to you, take courage, get up, I'm calling you. And recognizing no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how little you think you know or have to offer, you have a unique and unrepeatable position in the master plan of the kingdom of God that only you can fulfill. And Jesus is desiring that for you now, tonight, and every day. It's a beautiful gift. Got a few minutes. That's all I have. Anything else you have? Questions, comments? Uh, Faith? I do have, because uh, when you were going over this, this um, stood out to me. So in verse 50, if you look at it grammatically, he threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Whereas it should be, he went to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you're looking grammatically, he mm. threw and, and that's like, no, he didn't just go to Jesus. He came to Jesus. Yeah, that's interesting. The focus of the, like, the, the sentences, like, energy or the subject is actually on Jesus, yeah. not on the blind. Like, Jesus is the magnet that pulls the blind man there. Yeah. It's not the action of the blind man. It's more the action of Jesus drawing the blind man to him. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Bruce. I'm thinking in the background of this story. Mm-hmm that maybe the Holy Spirit is working through uh, Bart, uh, I can't get his name, blind man. Call him Bart. Bart. And, uh, <laughs> because, because he couldn't be calling Jesus the son of David on his own because he hasn't been to seminary or any place where he might have learned that. Something's telling him that, mm. I would think, the Holy Spirit. And then, he, at the end, he's commended for his faith. Mm -hmm. We don't manufacture our own faith. Mm -hmm. That's given to us by the Holy Spirit. Now we can turn it down or use it or whatever, but we don't. We don't do it. So, in a way, 
subtly, Jesus is having a conversation during all of this with the Holy Spirit. The mm. Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you know, let me talk to this guy for a while and see where we go with it. And uh, I, that just lets me know that the Holy Spirit is active all the time, too, not just Jesus by himself. Mm. There's some teamwork going on there. Yeah. You know, I would yes and that and say, yes, the scripture says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so just by the fact that we confess that, it's because the Holy Spirit's at work in us. But the end I would add to that is that I think also because this guy was blind, A, nobody wanted to listen to what he had to say, and he couldn't see anything. So he was forced to listen. And when you're forced to listen, the words that other people share and the things that he may have been hearing passing in and out of Jericho near Jerusalem as these people are coming back down from Galilee, migrating on pilgrimages, they may have resonated more deeply with him because he was more easily willing to set aside things that other people would have wanted to say or see, but he couldn't do those things. He wasn't allowed to. He was forced to just always listen and be put more in a posture of humility. And so he, in essence, is kind of the prime example of these children that have been brought before Jesus and put as an example for the disciples. And now he is put forth here as another example of see what happens when you listen and you stop trying to see or speak for yourself. Maybe you'll actually hear, in the midst of all of these rumors, the truth. I absolutely think it was the Holy Spirit inspiring him to do that, but I also think it's because he was much more compelled to listen than the rest of us would have been. Thank you. Anyone on Zoom have anything? No? Hi, you guys. Yes, Greg. I, I was just thinking here about the fact that I think in a, in a previous... <clears throat> In a, free, a previous Bible session from you, the fact, I think it was a discussion, the fact that Jesus is just kind of going through, and this blind man is there, it's up to the blind man to take action and call him. Mm -hmm. Like you said, I remember you said one time Jesus wasn't running from a village and village saying, can I help you, can I help you? Mm -hmm. If you want help, you get help, ask for it. Yeah. But if you don't, Jesus would have walked on by, and that would have been it. So. You're right, and that's what he does here. Right? He still gives him a chance. And Jesus, same thing for us, right? He gives us just enough. He gave the blind man just enough. He heard somehow through the crowd that it was Jesus of Nazareth. And that gave the blind man just enough to make a decision. Do I respond or do I stay here? And it's the same thing for all of us, right? God will never give you enough evidence to know with 100% assurance that he is real. Because then it wouldn't be free will. You just have to accept it. Be like two plus two is four. Be like, well, regardless of what I think, like two plus two is four. Like, who cares? He gives us just enough to where we still have to make that leap of faith. And it's exactly what happens here. He walks by. Jesus doesn't stop, doesn't approach him. He waits for him to respond. But when he does call out, it's clear that Jesus had been listening the whole time. That's a good reminder for all of us, too. I think Bruce had mentioned this, that no matter what, when we approach Jesus, he hears us. He hears us. He's approachable to all of us. Thanks. Maureen? I, I was just thinking how differently Jesus healed the two blind men, the one between uh, Mark 8 mm -hmm. and this one between uh, Mark 10. Is Mark 8 when he like, leads him away and does the weird spit thing? Yeah, okay, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, it is radically different, right? But in both, he does what's unexpected, and he does what he's going to do because he's approached in faith. And the, the blind men both just go with it. They don't have their preconceived notions. I mean, go back and read the one in Mark 8. It's bizarre. Like, he puts his fingers in his ears like he's like a battery, and then, like, literally spits in his mouth. Remember that? It's uncomfortable, right? It's intimate, you know? I feel like I was glad I was blind, because if I saw that coming, I would have ran, you know? Anyways, definitely, definitely different. But both show radical faith. And that was something the disciples needed to see, and they were still struggling with, and we're allowed to struggle with. And yet, no matter what, we're, where we are in that struggle, where we're totally faithful, we're totally feeling like on the brink of faithless, Jesus is still there, welcoming us home. So let's pray and thank God for that gift. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this evening, for this time in your word, and for all of the ways that this speaks very practically to us in our own faith today. I just pray, Lord, that the words and the reflections and the questions that were shared this evening would continue to burn in our hearts, continue to challenge and convict us to follow you more faithfully, and especially be willing to set aside our own preconceived notions, our own plans, 
our own pigeonholed or narrow ideas of who you are and who you're desiring to be in our life. And be willing to just open our hands and let go and say, whatever you want, God, mind, body, soul, my whole life, it's yours. Heal me, correct me, make me whole. Not just in this one little area, not just for one hour out of my week, but in every single moment of every week, of every day of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.